to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther chapter 4, verse number 14. We welcome you today to our study of the beautiful book of Esther that highlights the providence and care of God for His people. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study, and we want to encourage you to find your Bible, have it ready, as we're going to study from the book of Esther today. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by individual Christians and members of the Church of Christ. We would love to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. You can look them up in your local town or check them out on our website, thegospelof.christ.com. We may have a church finder there that would help you a great deal with that. So visit the church in your area. You will find people who love God, who love the truth, who are concerned about lost souls and more than anything want to help men and women get to heaven. Maybe you'd like to learn more about the church or the plan of salvation or how Christians worshiped in the Bible. People at the Lord's Church would love to sit down and study the Bible with you, and they would only be concerned about striving to do what God says in His Word. Friend, we'd also like to help you in your journey to know God here at the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can find a wide variety of good Bible study materials. We have over 500 lessons on every book of the Old and New Testament and a wide variety of topical studies that would indeed be beneficial for you in your study of God's Word. If you'd like to have a copy of any of those lessons, including today's lesson, just log on to our website, Fill out a media request form. We can send that to you as a digital download. Or if you need a hard copy in DVD or CD form, we'd be glad to make that available to you as well. We'll even pay the postage to get that to you. And friend, we want to encourage you in our world where everybody has a smartphone and life seems to move so fast, check out our app in the Gospel of Christ, the Gospel of Christ app in both the Android and Apple Play stores. Those can be downloaded for free there as well. As we now turn our attention to the beautiful story of Esther, one of the things that is really unique about Esther is that in the Bible, Esther is the only book where the name of God doesn't occur. And yet every page, every idea, every breath almost in the book of Esther, you can see the providence, the care, and the concern of God for His people. Esther is about the idea of providence. That is, God is working through people through human means and through the affairs of this world to achieve his ultimate outcome and purpose for his people. And Esther is surely a beautiful story of that. To lay out the story of Esther, it's important for us to understand who some of the main characters are in this book. We have a man by the name of Ahasuerus or Xerxes. He is the king of Persia during this time, and he's the one who has the power or authority over Esther and the Jews in some ways at this time. There is a queen by the name of Vashti. She seems to be a, a pretty good woman. She's not willing to do the request that the king makes, which very well may be immoral and ungodly to parade her in front of a, a drunken group of men. And yet, as a result of that, Vashti is deposed as the queen of Persia. You have a man by the name of Mordecai. He is the counselor and uh, kinfolk, the relative of Esther, and he seems to be, as it were, her mentor, one who even helped raise her and her mentor, and he's a man of great faith and trust in God, and he believes in God's providence as well. 
And then one of the main characters, whom the book is named after, Esther. Esther is a Jewish maiden, one who learns to put her faith and trust in God and who eventually God puts in the place of being the queen of Persia ultimately to save his people and no doubt to bring the Christ into the world. And then there is one more main character in the book of Esther, and that is a wicked, wicked man by the name of Haman. He is a prideful man. He is a man who is full of himself. He is a man who hates the Jewish people because Mordecai, the Jew, won't bow down before him, and he wants to extinguish the whole race because of that. And so that's kind of the story and the plot and the main characters that we find in the book of Esther. Now let's kind of go chapter by chapter and overview the story and what happens in the book of Esther. In Esther chapter 1, we have this scene where uh, Hashurus, Xerxes, uh, throws this big banquet, this big party for many days, and toward the end of that banquet or party, there is much revelry and drinking, and, and they have drunk well at this time. Very likely, they're uh, high on the alcohol there, and uh, Xerxes sends for the queen of Persia, Vashti. He, it looks like as though he wants to parade her through like a prized possession and show her beauty off, and even some may suggest that that would have been a very immodest, immoral thing that he was doing there. She refuses to come because she doesn't believe in that, don't want to be paraded through like that. And as a result, that woman is deposed. She no longer is the queen of Persia. You know, when you think about chapter one, there was a cost to what Vashti did and what she believed. She believed in not being paraded through there, likely in a very immodest, Im immoral way, just for people to gawk at her beauty. She wasn't, didn't want to do that. And so she refused based on her principles of right and modesty, and it cost her. She was put down as queen, and someone else is going to be put in her place. Friend, when we think about the cost of doing right, we're reminded of the good decision that this woman made. In every Christian's life, there is always a cost to doing right. Luke chapter 14, we are encouraged to count the cost. There's always a cost to what we do, but that cost, if it, if it, if it is the case that we are trusting God and serving Him and putting our faith in Him, to stand up for what's right, to not talk like the world, to not dress like the world, to not be involved in the immoral practices that the world may want us to do, there may be a physical, social cost to that. Friend, but spiritually speaking, doing that is always the right thing. We know God is pleased when we make good decisions and we need to follow and serve Him in every way. Now because Vashti has been deposed, in chapter 2 it's as though the king is now sad because of what he did. He begins to look back on the matter. He's kind of sad and depressed. And so some of his counselors suggest that he needs to search through the land and pretty much find a new wife. And so there is this, we don't want to say contest, but there is this process by which they look for the fairest maidens, the most beautiful women in all the land. They're brought, and they're each brought before the king, and, and they each spend some time with them. And eventually, one is going to be uh, chosen as one who would take the place of Vashti. And, and it pretty much looks like here that this is a, a beauty contest, for a lack of a better word. My friend... That is, doesn't even begin to catch the, the idea of what's going on here that God is working through. God is going to bring the one He chooses to be Queen of Persia. He is going to use that for His purpose, His ultimate plan, and His ultimate will, even though some of the things that are done here by these people are not right. God is going to work and weave His plan into this, and thus we're reminded of the providence of God to save His people throughout this process. Women come before Xerxes, and ultimately Esther, 
The Jewish maiden is chosen to be the queen of Persia. And, and God is going to work. through. And, and you can see not only the salvation of the Jewish people, but friend, if you don't see God working to bring Christ into the world, the salvation of the Jewish people, although that would be a, a big deal in the immediate, in the future, in the remote, the bringing of the Christ into the world is the ultimate thread that no doubt has to run through that. Now, in chapter 2, you're also going to see a, a little more of the providence of God. Esther's already been promoted. What about Mordecai? If he's going to help, something good needs to happen for him as well. Look in chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. This is a really... In a, this is a really unique idea that we find here. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gates, two of the king's units, Big Than and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Now, this is a pretty good story. Pretty, uh, the, glad the king was saved. Mordecai did a good thing. He went through Esther, and this is remembered in his name. And then it's kind of dropped until a little bit later. And that story arises with such a powerful impact on the overall theme of Esther. But again, we just want to emphasize in chapter 2, you've got Esther rising to the forefront. You've got this good thing happening to save the king in Mordecai's name. And now both of these Jewish people are, are being utilized by God with his providence to save his people. Then we turn to chapter 3. And the plot takes a very ugly twist, we might say. The man Haman, who we mentioned, is one of the uh, key generals, key figures in Ahasuerus' court, in his uh, cabinet, we might say. And uh, he is one who is full of pride. He wants everybody to know he's second in command, as it were. He, he wants people, when, when he comes out, he has the mindset that everybody ought to fall down and worship and honor him. The problem is... Mordecai, the Jew, he's only going to worship God. When everybody falls down in front of Haman, uh, Haman's pretty happy about that until he looks over and sees Mordecai. He's just standing there. He's not going to fall down. He's not going to worship him. And the scripture tells us that Haman is enraged. When he, wants, when he sees that Mordecai, that, that Jew, won't fall down before him, he's enraged about that. He goes home. He begins to complain to his wife. He begins to, as it were, cry on her shoulder about this. And his wife says, let me tell you what to do. You go build some gallows. You go build a, a gallow on which you can hang Mordecai and you set this plan in action. You get the king's approval and all will go well and what a wonderful thing that will be. In fact, it might be good if you just wipe out the whole Jewish people. And that plan is eventually going to be approved. Haman goes before the king. He's going to have the plan that all the Jews in the region of Persia can be wiped out. The king's going to sign that with his own decree. And this edict is going to go out that on a certain day of a certain month, all the Persians can fight against and kill with the king's approval every Jew they find. And so it looks like the whole Jewish nation is going to be wiped out. Now friend, that, that may not mean a whole lot to you until you realize if that happens, what about Christ? What about Mary and Joseph? What about their family? What about bringing the Messiah, the Savior, into the world? And now this isn't just a story that is important for the Jewish people. It's a story that's important to all of us when we think about it from that perspective. And so Mordecai knows the edict that's gone out. Esther has to know as well what has happened, and now Mordecai is going to encourage Esther, 
This is what you've been put in this place for. You, you've been anointed Queen of Persia, not just for the position itself, but for a bigger plan to save the whole Jewish nation and ultimately to help bring the Christ into the world. And so in chapter 4, I want you to notice what Mordecai is going to say to Esther. Look in chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And then he says these powerful words, Yet who knows? Who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And so Mordecai tells her what's happened. He tells her about the plot to destroy the Jews. He's greatly troubled about that. And he sends word to Esther. Don't think that you're going to, just because you're in the king's palace doesn't mean you're not a Jew and that you won't be killed. But then he pauses in essence and says, but you know, maybe, perhaps, this is the very reason God put you in this spot. Who knows whether you've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. And Esther takes that to heart. She in essence says, you go and fast. Me and my maidens, we're going to go and fast. I'm going to go into the king even when I've not been asked to come. And if I perish, I perish. What great faith Esther had to do this great thing. Friend, here's the practical application. Why are we in the kingdom of God? To what purpose have we been called? Why has God put you where you are in your life? Whether it be your job, whether it be with your family, whether it be in the position of influence that you have. Friend, each of us needs to take to heart the fact that wherever we are and what position we find ourselves, God can use us for a greater purpose, to advance His will, to promote the kingdom, to reach lost souls, to reach many people with the message and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in chapter 5, Queen Esther now has gone before the king. She's going to have uh, this banquet uh, Haman has built his gallows and everything that you see there. But now Esther has a plan to bring Haman down and to help Mordecai and God's people do what's right. And so she has this banquet in chapter 5. She invites uh, the king and she invites Haman. And Haman's plot against Mordecai is eventually going to be made known. But do you remember that story? that we told in chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. Um, so Haman is going to go before the king. He's going to have this idea, what should be done. Uh, the king has this idea. He's heard about the story of, of what Mordecai did. Haman thinks that the king is going to exalt him. But what actually happened is, one night when the king couldn't sleep, he was reading the annals of the king, and he read about what Mordecai did. And so Haman, who is so full of himself, the king calls him in, and he says, uh, what should be done for the, the one who the king wants to exalt? And here's what Haman says. Haman says, you need to get one of the best horses out of your fleet. You need to put one of the king's garments on this man. You need to have one of your most faithful servants parade him around town and say, this is the one who the king exalts. And so Haman naturally thinks, because all he can think about is himself, is that the king has to be talking about me. But in reality, the king wants to honor Mordecai for what he did, and it is actually Mordecai who is put on that horse, who is clothed in the king's robe, and it's Haman the prideful, arrogant Haman who has to lead that horse around town saying to everybody what a great man Mordecai is. And so the tables are starting to turn a little bit. But now Esther sets this plot in place where God's people can be saved. She goes before the king. 
She makes her request known to the king. The king realizes kind of what has happened uh, because he signed a decree and the laws of the Medes and the Persians, once you put your signet ring on it, you couldn't undo it. Once it was done, it was done. Another plan is made where on this day, when God's people are supposed to be extinguished, uh, Xerxes actually sets in motion a plan where the Jews can defend themselves and the Jews can receive help from the nation and the military of Persia to actually do that. And so God begins to work and weave his plan into this. But also, during this time, you remember those gallows? Remember those gallows that Haman made to hang Mordecai on? Well, while the queen is talking to the king about this plan. And while she's having this banquet, uh, Mordecai realizes, or Haman kind of realizes, his fate is in jeopardy. And he, in essence, falls down on the queen, begging her to save his life. He falls in her lap, as though it were, and the king realizes what he's done. That's very inappropriate for him to do. Uh, Esther also identifies him as the one who is trying to kill Mordecai and all the Jews. And in chapter 7, those same gallows that Haman built to have Mordecai hanged on, the king says, take this man out, have him hanged. Him, his family, eventually his sons, the whole group of wicked, evil people who are against the Jews are going to be destroyed. And so when you think about the plot twist here, You've got Esther saving God's people. You've got Mordecai rising up. You've got God's people being able to defend themselves. You've got the enemy, the wicked one, Haman, being destroyed on those gallows. And then we open to chapter 8. Mordecai is advanced because of what Mordecai did, because of his wisdom, because of his ability to help and save the king, because of his support and mentoring uh, uh, of Esther, Mordecai is now pretty much advanced to the place that Haman has. The Jews are given the power and the authority to defend themselves on this certain day. And in chapter 9 and chapter 10, of the book of Esther, you see the providence and power of God on full display. That day comes. God's people are completely saved. The Jews are not harmed. God's people are completely saved. All the wicked people who might have been aligned with Haman, including his family, his sons, and other evil people, are destroyed with the force and the might of the Jews and the Persian uh, Empire as well. And ultimately, the Jewish nation is saved through what one woman and one man had the faith in God to do. You know, when you think about that story, little Esther there, who is eventually put in a one, of the, the, one of the greatest positions of power a woman could be put in at that day, the queen of Persia. Why did that happen? Mordecai, finding out that plot about the two men who were going to kill Xerxes. Mordecai being advanced over Haman. Haman being hanged. What was all that about? Well, you know, if we're too short-sighted, we can just say to ourselves, that was the providence of God in taking care of the Jewish people, the Israelite nation at that point of time. And we, we can kind of see the providence of God there, but we can miss the bigger picture. Friend, the bigger picture is this. From eternity, God had made a plan to send His Son, the Savior, into the world. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 20, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. That plan, even by evil, wicked people, was not going to be thwarted. Mordecai said it. Deliverance and a Savior will arise from some. If you choose to do this, you and your family are not to do this. You and your family are going to be destroyed, but deliverance will arise for God's people. Friend, the ultimate deliverer, the ultimate Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Esther, you've got to not only see God's providence working through these Jewish people, but we've got to see God continuing 
to weave and to work His plan through those who are trying to destroy it. Men may, the, the nations may rage, as Psalm 2 says, but God is going to deal with them in His justice and in His anger. And so as you think today about the story of Esther, what a great woman. She was. You know, Esther gets a lot of credit, but Mordecai, he also deserves a, a lot of credit for his encouragement, his mentorship, and his desire to put God above all else. Two practical lessons we want you to think of today. As we think about Mordecai and Esther, let's look to our lives, and, and let's really look to ourselves and ask, am I rising up to the opportunities to the challenges and to the open doors that God sets before me. Maybe you've been called to the kingdom to do great things. Are you rising up and taking a hold of that challenge and utilizing it to the best of your ability in this life? Are you letting God use you to His purpose and His glory? And then, my friend, a second powerful lesson that we learn is God's plan is always going to come true. God's people are always going to be taken care of by God, and ultimately it was God's plan to send Jesus Christ, the Messiah, into the world, and nobody, King Xerxes, Haman, whoever it was, nobody was going to get in the way of that. Friend, that's how much God wants to save people. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Friend, have you submitted your life to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you obeyed the gospel? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world? John chapter 8, verse 24. Would you turn from a, a life of sin in repentance to God, Luke chapter 13, verse 5, would you confess with your mouth Jesus as the Savior of the world, Romans 10, verse 10, and have every sin washed away? Would you be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins? May God help each of us to rise up to the opportunities He gives us and to be the best servant we can in His kingdom. We hope you'll join us next time as we'll study more from the Word of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the